Recording. If you want to say presence, that'd be cool. Um, any questions before we begin? All right, cool. Well, today we'll get into software defined networks, um, which is sort of a culmination of uh, everything we've been learning thus far, uh, except that everything can happen in one place, maybe. So uh, let's see how that might be true. Um, need to share. Okay. Cool. So, software defined networks. Um, so, thus far, we've been talking about um, forwarding data in the internet or in a large network um, through routers, where we divide the data plane and the control plane. Okay. So, the data plane is the act of forwarding data along the different hubs. A router gets a packet. There are some bits in a packet. Those bits uh, maybe represent the destination IP address. And then based on that, the router looks up the output interface by looking into its forwarding table. OK, and based on that, makes a forwarding decision. The forwarding table is created as a result of a routing algorithm um, in which routers exchange reachability information with each other. Uh, this is, happens in the control plane. And eventually this router says, okay, to reach some destination connected to this router, I need to forward packets to this prefix out this particular interface. Okay? So there's an interaction of the process, the control plane process here, which then creates routing tables or forwarding tables and installs them at individual routers. Okay? And this is basically the, the point of uh, PA4. Okay, so let's look at some scenarios where this approach doesn't quite work. Okay, so on the right here, we have uh, a prototypical network. And um, using a routing approach, we might find the shortest path between U and Z going through X and Y. And that's what we did before. But now let's say that the operator, for whatever reason, uh, wants to forward the traffic on a different path through V and W. Using the traditional routing approach, we would, the operator would not be able to do that because the routing algorithm would pick the shortest path. That's what it's supposed to do. But let's say this path becomes congested. It's still the shortest path in terms of number of hops, but it's no longer the shortest path in terms of delay. And so at that point, um, the operator might want to send the traffic onto a different route or try to send it on a different route for any number of reasons. Maybe, you know, why is a router in China and there's a policy that says traffic cannot leave the U.S. or something like that, right? So operators need flexibility to use their network more flexibly than just simply send data on the shortest path. Okay? So one possibility of tricking the um, the routing system to do that, to pick a different route, is to kind of adjust the links or the link weights on the path we want to be lower than on the path we don't want. And so the operator could get in there and kind of change these link weights, but now all the traffic would switch onto this path. Okay? And it's really not the right way of doing this because if we change the link VW to use this path, well, now the result could be that other paths end up using link VW because it seems cheaper, but its its price is only artificially delayed or reduced for one uh, for one specific path, right? So it's kind of this kludgy approach that doesn't really quite work. And then, you know, even after we change link weights, we need to kind of verify that the routing algorithm does what we want. It's just it's just not the right approach. Okay. So what if uh, the operator wants to split the traffic to use two different paths? And well, the routing algorithm uses one path, uses the shortest path. So splitting it onto multiple paths, for example, to send data in parallel or to balance the load, 
doesn't really work in this in the traditional writing algorithm unless we configure the link the link weights to provide us equal cost paths, right? But even that gets touchy because that's only for kind of you know the path from U to Z, but this may not work for other paths that exist in this network. Okay. Um, also, there's a problem in that um, if we just want to split the traffic going between these two hosts, whatever we do in terms of changing the link weights in this network would affect all the other traffic as well. So we don't really have this choice of just doing something for one particular flow um, because then we need to maintain per flow state, which is not really what these routers do. Uh, what they do is maintain kind of per prefix or per destination state to be able to deal with a large number of nodes in the internet. Okay? So again, we're at odds with what we want to do and what we can do. Okay? Um, the other possibility is that for whatever reason, we may want to forward two pieces of traffic differently. Okay, so this traffic might, we might want to go on this path and the green traffic might, want, we might want to forward it on this path. Right. From the point of view of W, the W needs to now differentiate between the flows and send one on this path and one on the other path. Okay. We also don't really have the facilities to, to do that using link state or distance vector. Okay. So primarily for these reasons, um, we want more flexibility. Right. We could do some of this using MPLS, right? but MPLS is... Um, kind of a very specific tool. It only works for, well, it doesn't only work for operators, but it's used by operators. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's less flexible than we want, right? We, we would want this to be available in all kinds of networks um, and um, provide the intelligence, not just by setting these different options using operator decisions, but to kind of automate uh, the decisions in this network using algorithms. Okay, so this is where we will have a locally, a logically centralized controller okay, that replaces the routing algorithm in coordinating the different routers or switches in this network. Okay, so we still have packets arriving in this network, okay, um, and this router will have a local agent Okay, or a control agent, which will then interact with the remote controller to ask, what should I do with this packet? Okay. So instead of the remote, the controller or the control plane kind of pushing the decisions um, sort of a priori into these switches, for each arriving packet, the switch can ask, hey, I don't know what to do with it, what do you think? And then the remote controller can say, oh, for this packet, we should do this, and then the forwarding rule can be installed kind of based on the traffic that's arriving at this at this switch. Questions? I'll take a pause here. Does anyone want to ask anything? All right. Okay. So let's look at an example of what these forwarding uh, tables might look like. Okay, so we want to send a uh, traffic from H5 and H6, host 5 and host 6, which are here, okay, to uh, host 3 and host 4 in this very simple network. Okay? We have an open flow controller uh, logically connected to all these different switches. And so that controller um, may install these forwarding rules. So let's say we have a packet from um, H5 to H6. That packet then could be forwarded to the open flow controller, which will reply with an entry into uh, this forwarding table. Okay? The entry could match things like, for example, IP source and IP destination. Okay? So for packets going between H5 and H6, which have these IP addresses, they're going to uh, H4 and H3, which have the same prefix. Okay? So the forwarding rule might look like that for packets that match this prefix and are destined for this prefix, for this prefix, they will be forwarded out into phase three. Okay. And so a similar rule can be installed at this switch, where for the same prefix and the same the same source prefix and the same destination prefix, 
and for packets coming from ingress port one, we're going to forward out into phase four. Okay. And now finally at this router, um, depending on the destination, not just the prefix, but the full destination of the packets, we may want to forward data out into phase three or into phase four. So right away, you can see that this gives you more flexibility. You can still do IP-based forwarding. You can still have prefix-based rules, and you can see what interface things come in on. Okay? So this is kind of merges the IP-based forwarding that we've had before for routing algorithms, and it borrows some of the ideas from MPLS, where we can look at where the traffic is coming from as part of the decision, as part of the forwarding decision. So if we look at this approach more broadly, you can ask, well, what fields would it be worth matching? Here we are matching against source and destination IP addresses, but we could be looking at other fields in these packets as well, potentially. Okay. And then right now, the only action we look at is forwarding packets. What other actions do you think it might be worthwhile to take out these routers? Okay, so let's start with the fields. What fields do you guys think would be worth matching? What options would you like to see? What other fields do we have at all? All right, would matching against, for example, port number be a good idea? If so, why? What would it give you? What would it tell you to match against this port number or another port number? You guys, I'm just going to start recording these lectures. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, I don't think the coffee set in yet. My brain's not getting there. <laughs> All right. So I jumped in kind of late, but if we're talking about port numbers, uh, are we talking about different protocols that are at different places it's going to send it to, like the HTTP or SMB or something like that? Yeah, sure. Is that sure. Kind of what you're saying? Yeah, very good. So certain <laughs> certain protocols or certain traffic is going to use certain port numbers, right? right? So if you you could forward traffic to port 80, which is to your web browser, on a different path than say port 22, which would be your SSH traffic. Okay, uh, so matching port numbers kind of gives you some idea about the application that's being forwarded, right? So now we could move application traffic onto different paths. Cool. Um, we could also look at other fields that are available, right? We don't have just the IP packet. Okay, uh, port numbers obviously are part of uh, uh, the transport layer. We have the network layer. We have the IP, and then at the link layer, we have Ethernet. If we looked at the Ethernet packets, we could use the software-defined network to do switching like a normal Ethernet switch. Okay? Right? So all the protocols that we looked at look at some fields. Right? They need the fields and packets to make decisions. If we have access to these fields, we could implement all these different protocols in the SDN. It's quite powerful. Right? Um, you could also look at, let's say, a packet from a field from Ethernet and a field from, uh, let's say, IP. Now you have a cross-layer approach where you can make a decision not just at the, at the link layer, not just at the network layer, but kind of at both of the layers at the same time. And this becomes quite powerful. All right, so what basically happens is that we have some, um, we have some rule, action, and then statistics. So, the rule can be based on these different ports. Okay? The incoming switch port, okay? um, the link layer field, which is VLAN ID, max source and destination, and uh, the type field, right? which is the kind of the high layer protocol. Okay? The network layer, we can look at uh, IP source, IP destination, IP protocol, V6 or V4. And then we can look at transport layer ports. There are more fields than that, but kind of the basic uh, SDN standard just defines these ports 
in the rules because it's kind of a good balance between flexibility and um, kind of compatibility between different um, between between different network, different manufacturers of of switches. Okay. Now the actions that could be taken at each router are well, one is to forward it, forward the packet, but we could also encapsulate the packet and forward it to the controller for a decision. Okay, so if a switch gets a packet and says, I don't know what to do with it, let me send it to the controller to, to inspect. Okay. Um, the switch could also drop the packet, say, I don't want to forward that packet anymore. Okay. Um, it could be sent to normal processing pipeline, meaning to like IP um, routing or to switching, right? Just kind of drop it out of the SDN. And it could also modify fields, right? Could modify any of these fields that you see here. Um, and we'll see later how it can be uh, kind of used to provide different services, right? And then you can also keep um, statistics, for example, as to how many packets are being forwarded or how much data is being forwarded to get some information about that. Okay. So let's look at some rules. So we can define a pattern where it says uh, for this IP destination, okay, we're going to forward it at port six. And that's just a basic forwarding action. Okay. We could also say that um, all the packets to port 22 will be dropped. And now this basically becomes a firewall against any connections to port 22. So now we just implemented firewall functionality just by installing a rule. Okay. Or you could do a uh, layer two switch forwarding where for anything with the source MAC address, we're going to forward it out uh, port three, not port six, port three. All right. So you can implement kind of layer two switching. All right. So basically, this allows SDN to unify different types of services, right? You can, you can have SDN switches act as routers based on uh, kind of IP longest prefix matching. Um, they could act as a switch and just look at MAC addresses. Okay. They could act as a firewall by blocking certain, certain traffic. Okay. And they can also uh, translate network addresses by rewriting um, IP addresses and ports. So now you don't need to install a separate uh, NAT in your network. You can just implement that using the SDN. And so all these different kind of types of functionality, I guess we're talking about firewalls uh, yet, but these different types of network functionality could simply be implemented as different rules operating on packets by inspecting their ports. Okay. So right now this controller can do all these things and is kind of still magical, okay. but let's see how we can kind of implement all the functionality at the controller. So the controller is logically centralized in the control plane. Okay? And then we can ask, well, what type of functionality should it provide? Um, what we've seen thus far is that it could really provide almost any functionality of the, uh, that's provided by the different layers of the network stack. All right. Now, if we're providing all this functionality at the same functionality as the network stack, it might make sense to actually divide that functionality into layers itself um, to, to organize it. We've seen that this organization is useful. So if it's useful in general, then it could also be useful inside, um, uh, inside the controller itself. Okay. So here's kind of the basic idea of how that could be implemented. So if you think of a mainframe system, okay, what you have is a specialized hardware. Let's say IBM builds this mainframe. You have a specialized operating system that's also built by IBM. And then you have applications that are mostly developed by IBM to run on the mainframe system. Right? The whole thing is controlled by a single manufacturer. Okay? On the other hand, you could have a bunch of manufacturers that create microprocessors. Right, Intel, AMD, others kind of in smaller devices, and then provide an interface to allow other manufacturers to build operating systems that work with these chips. Okay. 
And then once we have these operating systems, there are also open interfaces that allow different applications to run on top of these operating systems. Okay, so it seems very natural to us to think of the architecture on the right as the right approach. Okay, it turns out though that networks aren't organized like that at all, right? Or at least not until the ends. Okay, so obviously there are disadvantages to kind of the centralized development of of hardware and software on the left, and you have these advantages um, of rapid innovation uh, driven by a large industry, um, which are largely enabled by having open interfaces between layers of functionality. Okay. So this is basically what happens inside SDN controllers. Okay. At the lowest level, we have the hardware switches, just like we had microprocessors that do the actual actions of forwarding packets or links of transmitting data over distances. Okay? And so the nice thing is that these switches can be fast and simple. They just forward data according to the tables installed in the rules. Okay? Um, they don't need to do anything else other than look at the table and forward the data. Okay? Those, the logic of how to form these, these uh, tables can be put somewhere else. It doesn't need to reside in the switch. It could be provided through an interface. Okay? So then basically these switches need to forward data and also provide an interface to the SDM controller okay? to uh, allow for directions from the SDM controllers to be installed and also to report data to the SDM controller so that the SDM controller can make some decisions. Okay? So we have a full action and an interface. Now at the SDM controller, it can provide kind of functionality of how to manage this hardware, just like the operating system provides functionality of managing or using the microprocessor hardware inside your computer. Okay? So the SDM controller can maintain network state information, things like who is connected to whom in this network. Okay? Um, it can provide an interface to applications running on top of the operating system. Okay. Um, it can interact with put directives into the hardware running below through the Southbound MPI. Okay. Um, and basically provide some things like robustness, performance, scalability, fault tolerance, the type of services we would normally expect operating system to, to, to isolate, to provide to isolate the applications from the hardware itself. And then finally, we have the applications which provide kind of the, the brains or control over the network. If you want to have a routing service, well, the routing servers just need to talk to the SDN controller to figure out what is the network topology. Okay. You can have a system that controls access. You can have a system that provides load balancing. Right? You can build these different applications and kind of replace them, use them from different vendors, evolve them, make them open sourced, right? And um, they can just use the information provided by the, by the SDN controller and then direct the operation of hardware through interfaces provided by this operating system. Questions? Anyone has a question? Okay. Cool. So now the question is, all right, this seems powerful enough. Why don't we just do everything inside the SDN? Okay. We have some things like at the transport layer, right? We have congestion control. We have reliable delivery. Uh, the application layer, we've seen caching of web data. Right? Are these things appropriate to work, to, to be handled by an application con uh, connected to an SDN controller? What do you guys think? I mean, I guess it really depends. Um, I've never really thought about it too much, but like, how much can it handle? You know what I mean? Like how how much traffic can it actually handle as far as like on a broader network? That's a very good question, right? So we still want the, the switches to do the actual forwarding of packets based on some tables because we know that that is fast. Okay? So it doesn't make sense for the controls for the switches to forward every packet for inspection into the SDN controller, right? That is 
seems very wasteful, right? So we also don't want the SDN controller to do things that can be done by the end hosts. So end-to-end -end reliability can be done by the end hosts. Congestion control can be done by the end host by deciding to send less data. So this was this works very well for like network up to the network layer, but everything that is normally done in the network stack on end-to-end -end basis should probably remain there um, just to distribute the load of, of uh, providing these types of services. So this is kind of like you can use a crescent wrench for almost any size, but it's probably not the best tool in every case because you might just strip that. Gotcha. Yep, exactly. Right. You you can do it in the SDN, but it's it's just it's, it's just not going to be fast. Okay, so let's look a little bit more closely into what's happening at this SDN controller and exactly how it interacts with with the applications above it. Okay. So um, we have the Salban MPI, which connects the switches to the SDN controller. The SDN controller interacts with these uh, using the communication layer. Okay? And here you can have a number of protocols. OpenFlow is really the standard right now for how to do it. So the switches can send some set of messages. These messages are defined in the OpenFlow standard. And they communicate a whole bunch of things that allows SDN to build um, the state. Okay? Now, these messages from the switches, and the message could be like, hey, I'm connected to this guy and this guy and this guy. Okay? That would go through OpenFlow messages to the SDN controller. And then based on that, the SDN controller might um, do things like build the link state information of who is connected to whom. Okay? Uh, it could learn things about what are the hosts that are connected. It could collect a bunch of statistics, maybe how much flow is going over this link, over that link, right? That would also be reported using OpenFlow messages. Once in a while, a counter would be would be delivered. Okay? So um, the SDN controller built, built some idea about what the network looks like. Okay, And then this information is made available through interfaces to the applications running on top of the SDN controller through the northbound MPI. Okay? So the link state info, for example, might be translated to a network graph that is then uh, the level of abstraction on which routing works. Okay? Could provide RESTful APIs, it could handle intents, which I'll come back to in a second. Okay. Um, okay. So as far as these open flow messages, yeah, still need to kind of think about what is the right set of messages for the switches and the SDN controller to, to exchange, right? What is a set that provides enough functionality but is not so large that kind of becomes unmanageable and difficult to standardize? And so um, the switch, for example, could report port status, right? who is connected to a port, um, is the port up. Um, when a packet arrives at the switch and the switch doesn't know what to do with it, um, it could send the packet to the open, uh, through OpenFlow to the controller so the controller can inspect it, okay? Um, it could report to the controller that, for example, a entry in a flow table has timed out. This is not the exclusive list, but just some kind of ideas, right? Um, the controller then could report, uh, could ask for counters, maybe how many packets have been forwarded on a, using a particular rule, um, could set the forwarding table, um, or could send a packet that has been previously reported to ask for it to be forwarded in a particular way. Right? And so we don't need to go into all the possible open flow messages. Uh, obviously, you guys can look this up, but uh, the, the message here is that the open flow API allows the SDN controller to understand the state of this network and the state of the traffic in some way, or at least at the level of counters or sample packets. Okay. And then it allows the SDN controller to send actions uh, to the switches to, to, to forward packets in a particular way. So this does this have like a particular time frame? So like every 60 seconds it re-updates and sends out this open flow, or is this just like a constant thing? 
It's a constant thing. It depends on what you're doing. So, for example, a packet arrives at a switch and the switch doesn't know what to do with it. Okay, so whenever a packet like that arrives, the switch would forward it to the SDN controller saying, hey, what do I do with a packet like this? It doesn't match any of my rules. Okay, and then the SDN controller could decide that, um, you know, it should go out into phase one and then it will install this rule on the switch. Next time the switch gets a packet like that, now that packet matches the rule and so it doesn't need to contract the SDN controller. The controller could also say, hmm, I want to do some load balancing, right? Maybe I have an intent where someone wanted this, some traffic to some destination to be balanced. Okay? So I can, to, to do this type of load balancing, I need to know how much traffic is being forwarded on one link over another. Right? Maybe this link is using too many flows and it's oversubscribed. Okay? So this in controller could query the counters on that particular link. Right, and that could happen at kind of any interval that's defined by the load balance. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So it's not so much like a time frame, more of like a, when it receives certain information, it it makes the decisions and then sends them out. Then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So. The the whole operation of this is driven by two things. It's driven by the traffic that's actually being sent into this network that can generate some events that percolate up. And it could also be driven by these applications that want to know certain things or want to change certain things. Good question. Okay. So that brings us to the northbound API, okay, where it basically provides an interface for these applications to change the state of the network. Okay, So it could be, for example, accepting intents. An intent should be like, I want packet from this source to be routed to this destination in some amount of delay. Okay, So the applications here could tell this the end what they want to happen, but not necessarily how it should happen. Okay. The, the, I'm not specifying the route I want the packets to take. I just want them to get there within some, within some delay. Okay. Um, it could also be more prescriptive where I want to set this flow table to look a particular way. Okay, can be done. Um, the routing system might want to query a network graph to see, to update the routing paths, right? And then change the forwarding, the flow tables based on that. Um, the applications could also subscribe to certain notifications, right? For example, load balancer could subscribe to counters of how much traffic is being forwarded on a particular link. Okay. So all those types of things are, are possible. So um, could you potentially then, instead of like saying the whole flow, but could you at least like exclude part of it too? Um, like certain destinations you don't want it to go pass through kind of a thing? Sure. Or would that Yep. Yep. You can do it. Right. You can say, I don't want, um, I don't want the flow to touch to be forwarded to these prefixes. Right. And then the router would have to figure out how to, how to do it. Okay. So let's look at a more concrete example <clears throat> of a link failing in this network. Okay. So we have some network, this link fails. Okay. Um, all right, so um, the switch one would say, okay, I have a failure of a link. I'm going to send a, a notification to the controller using OpenFlow. Okay. Um, OpenFlow receives that message and now it says, okay, this link is no longer active. I need to update my link state information. Okay. Once that link state information changes, okay, um, there could be a subscription made by the routing application that says, hey, anytime anything changes in the link state, in the link state do let me know <laughs> that something has changed because I need to potentially recompute routes. Okay? Now, the routing algorithm could, needs to run Dijkstra, but to do that, it needs to get the network graph. Okay? So it contacts not the link state information. This information is already incorporated in the network graph, but the routing algorithm works with the abstraction of the network graph to compute the path. 
right? Based on the new path, the routing algorithm could install different flow tables, okay? And now those could be pushed through OpenFlow to the different switches to not route S1, S2, S4, but S2, S3, S4, for example. So um, it's if you organize a network, right, a large network in this way, you basically have a set of switches that uh, operate this hardware forwarding based on flow tables and software using OpenFlow, which then reports data to some controller, which sits somewhere in this network. Now, this controller could be, it's really logically centralized. It could be a number of controllers that all talk together uh, to figure out what they should do, right? But we talk about it as being logically centralized, but in practice, it could be physically decentralized, okay? And then you have different controllers that are implemented, open daylight, frenetic, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, sorry, open that has a controller. Frenetic is um, used by Axe Maryland Metal, uh, which is a language for network configuration. So if you want something to happen in the network, you can describe it in code using, using Frenetic. Okay. Um, but it doesn't really solve all the problems in the internet, right? We're still talking about a network that is really controlled by one entity. Someone has to be in charge of the controller, right? Someone has login rights to change how the controller behaves. So when we think about a network the size of the internet, it doesn't really, it's not controlled by a single organization, right? So things like inter-domain traffic still needs to be forwarded using BGP. Once you move from one autonomous system to another, you can move from one SDN network to another SDN network. But since those run in different autonomous systems, they're still going to use BGP or they still use BGP right now to uh, exchange reachability. And BGP is also far more scalable than, than a, uh, any, even a distributed SDN controller, okay? Um, if you want to uh, do network virtualization and latency, well, sometimes other types of protocols can be faster, right? MPLS can still be faster than the more flexible SDN approach, okay? Um, SDN still takes a lot of computation, which, you know, may or may not be the right thing for certain types of services, okay? And then depending on how you configure the forwarding tables, right, you may not have the benefit of the same level of prefix aggregation that you have for IP, right? If you make these rules very complicated, um, one, they take more space, two, they're not just, the forwarding tables aren't just destination-based, they could potentially be flow-based where this particular flow from this source IP on this port should do this thing, okay? From the same IP on a different port, it should do a different thing. And I'm pretty sure you have a very, very detailed tables, which then takes, a, one, they take a lot of space, and because they take a lot of space, they, any time a packet comes in, it takes a long time to find the right rule that applies to that packet, which makes the switching slower, All right? So it's a, it's a powerful tool, but it doesn't do everything. It's SDNs aren't going to replace everything you guys have learned about networking, right? They're, they're just kind of a, a way to organize some of the functionality in a flexible way. Okay. And then you guys have different controllers that you can use. I think I'm asking you guys to use Floodlight in, uh, in the lab that I posted yesterday or two days ago. Um, so it's a pretty fun lab. You guys are actually using an SDN controller. Uh, in a virtual network called Mininet on your machines. Um, so it's a pretty powerful tool. I hope you guys um, kind of enjoy it. It's a good way for you guys to test your network applications as well. If you're ever developing something that's, that runs on multiple hosts and you say, okay, well, how do I test it? Okay, I guess I need to build a network on AWS. Well, you don't need to. You can actually stand up networks pretty quickly using, using Mininet. It's quite, quite handy. Okay. So there's no midterm. This is an old slide. No one freak out. Um, 
<laughs> so uh, that finishes my lecture for today. Uh, do you guys have any any other questions? Any questions? Yeah, is there like a particular protocol um, that uh, like a universal protocol for SDNs, or is it just kind of like anybody's game? You know how you want to configure that. It's pretty much open flow. Yeah. Fair enough. There are others, but like everything is based on open flow. Gotcha. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys. I guess we're a little bit early. I am okay with that. Um, all right. I will talk to you on Friday. We're going to get into wireless networks. I can't wait. Thanks, uh, thanks for the good scare there. I thought we had a midterm. And... Yeah. <laughs> Late midterm. Oh, gosh. <laughs> should, I should leave it for like April, <laughs> April Fools. Right. That would be perfect. <laughs> that would be perfect. Good idea. Thank you. I appreciate right, it. Bye, guys. Have a good one. Professor Whitty. Oh, hey. another thing. I don't know.